Hey everybody, this is Trev. One quick thing that we forgot to mention in this episode is something that we want everybody to know about, and that is that on Saturday, January 6th in Los Angeles, Jasmine Bristow is going to be facilitating a workshop that's all about writing your 2018 story. It's going to be a day of journaling, dreaming, and planning, um, getting clarity and learning tools uh, that you can implement to support you in having a really fulfilled and intentional and successful 2018. So, uh, keep an eye on our newsletter and our social media and our Facebook and all that for details on exactly where and when that's going to be. But it, it will be at some point uh, on Saturday, January 6th in L.A. and details uh, coming soon. OK, here's the episode. The Changemakers are habitually putting themselves in other people's shoes and asking, what does the world need and how can I contribute to that? You're listening to Inside Acting, a podcast dedicated to demystifying the inner and outer game of success in the entertainment industry. I'm AJ Meyer. And I'm Trevor Algott. And coming up today in episode 301, the final episode of 2018, AJ and I each share three of the biggest lessons we've learned from 300 episodes of Inside Acting. It's pure and simple. It's all about reflecting on the who, the what, the how, and the why of the past seven and a half years of the podcast. Stay with us. Support for this episode of Inside Acting is brought to you in part by Rehearsal Pro, the current version of Rehearsal, the essential app for actors that is now available in the iTunes App Store. If you want to learn your lines, be off book for your auditions, explore your character, make stronger choices, and do a whole lot more, go to rehearsal.pro slash IAP right now to learn about all the great new features in the new version of Rehearsal, the groundbreaking app designed by actors for actors. That's rehearsal.pro slash IAP. Hey, everybody. 301 episodes. Thank you so very much for helping us get to this milestone. Um, 300 episodes, obviously, was celebrated with a big party, and we had a lot of people come out to the event that was really special. Um, Really, really special. And... uh, Thank you so much, everybody, who came out to support us and who has made this podcast possible throughout the years. And so many kind words and so much love. It it, it was a wonderful reminder for me, uh, and I know you as well, AJ, just to see that, like, oh, yeah, this thing we're we're sinking so much time and energy into is really making a big difference in people's lives and it's it for me at least it's it's often easy to forget that so it was a really wonderful affirmation for me to just see how this thing we're making is doing in the world you know yeah yeah well and not only was the getting to see everyone at the party and and you know meeting some listeners in in person for the first time ever but we're still you know, getting uh, every once in a while, we'll get somebody who will who will tweet at one of our guests uh, from you know several episodes ago and say, you you know, I'm so glad you came on the show. Your 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 episode was amazing or whatever. And I look at this person's Twitter handle and I'm like, I've never heard of this person. I don't think they've ever tweeted at us. I don't think they've ever emailed the podcast or anything. So there are potentially thousands of listeners listening who don't engage and 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 that's uh just to sort of you know add to what you were saying about the affirmation piece it's it's hard to it's hard to know sometimes like the 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 impact and then and then all of a sudden you have you know a party like that or you know uh you see uh, a tweet like that and it's like wow there's there are a lot of people out there you know, who, um, listen to, uh, enjoy and get a lot out of the podcast and, and, and we don't necessarily always know. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the numbers for, you know, who listens to the podcast and where they're from, it's like, 
it is amazing, like less than far less than one percent of our listeners actually engage with us. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I listen to a no, ton of- n- not at all. It's not a complaint. It's just like a whoa. <laughs> right. I-, I listen to a ton of podcasts and I never engage with any of them. And yet I so love and appreciate them and they definitely go on to influence my life. So, um, yeah, it's it's always fun to see. I always tell people it's like it's interesting because the same like my body physiologically does not know the difference between sending an email to somebody and publishing a podcast. It is the same physical action to hit send on an email as it is to hit the publish button for a podcast. And so it's it, it, you have to sort of intellectually engage with the idea. Oh, that's a really interesting way of putting it. Yeah. Also want to just give a quick welcome and shout out, very warm welcome and shout out to a few people that have joined the membership since we last um, had a traditional sort of uh, episode. Uh, Kevin McCorkle, Robert Mello, Nathaniel Smith, Kenneth Shook, and Bruce Clifford. Uh, even had a chance to meet a handful of you guys at the uh, at the party. And it's so cool to put a face and an energy and a vibe uh, to the name and um, to have you, uh, you know, as part of the family now and every bit of support you send our way goes directly back into making this podcast uh, a continuing thing. So thank you so much for your support and to being part of the family. Uh, welcome. Thank you. All right. So this um, episode is all about lessons learned. We typically take these year, these quarterly, uh, especially and the year end episodes to take time to sort of ask ourselves what's working in our lives, what's not, what's next, what are our declarations and intentions. But given that we're at sort of a milestone here. I thought we'd shake it up a little bit, and instead of just doing the traditional thing, we would, uh, and we're still doing that sort of personally, uh, and AJ, you put together an incredible sort of 2017 retrospective on your year. It's very comprehensive. I'm excited to sort of dig into that even more. But we wanted to get a little bit more macro with it and just look at three of the biggest lessons that we've learned from producing 300 episodes of this podcast over the past seven and a half years. And uh, I haven't actually shared mine with you in writing yet, AJ. So when I speak about this here, it'll be the first time you're hearing it. But I've taken a look at yours and you've got uh, several more lessons than just three that you've learned uh, and will be sharing. There's so much content and so many things that I've learned from, you know, uh, seven and a half years, 300 episodes of the podcast that, you know, even your suggestion, hey, we should do like three big learns. I was like, okay. And I have like eight (laughs) On, on, in my document, I'm like, yeah, three, sure, Trev. Well, right off the top, uh, in your document, you've got just below your 2018 goals. You list your biggest learn, your number one biggest learn from 300 episodes, as being uh, that your acting career and life in general are entirely interwoven, and building a successful career means building a happy life full of amazing experiences. And we've talked about this many times before. You know, the, the more complete and well-rounded and engaged you are in life, it's the same for your art, for your work. Um, But you said something interesting here at the end where you said, it's okay to allow myself to focus on other things that doesn't make me a bad actor or unfocused. And I can certainly relate to that statement. I know a lot of actors that feel like if they're not working on acting, they're not work, they're, they're not working They're They're being distracted. They're not being productive. And it's definitely been a lesson I've had to learn many times over, and I still need to learn it almost on a daily basis, that just because I'm not focused on my, you know, quote unquote craft or whatever it is, doesn't mean that the uh, composting process isn't happening in my subconscious, that I'm not, um, you know, that I'm not uh, becoming a, a more enriched human being uh, that can then, you know, transmute that into art of some kind. Yeah. I mean, I came out of, you know, college and and this was obviously before we started the podcast, but I had three years before we started three and a half years before we started the podcast of like, I need to be doing as much work as I was doing in college or, you know, I can't call myself an actor. Like if I'm not working, you know, other people work a nine to five, and, and, and they get to call themselves by the title of that job. So if I'm not working at least that much, I can't call myself an actor. And, you know, they, unless you're creating your own work, which is a lot of what's happening nowadays, and, and it was just starting to come around at that time, 2009, um, then, you know, there's only so much that we can control. And so I, I would I would sit there. I've talked about this probably years ago on the podcast. I would sit there for hours 
clicking and submitting on like actors access, the sort of self submission, uh, uh, side of actors access, just trying to get anything like get a, um, you know, a student film audition or short film audition or something like that. I, I booked nothing from those years, like zero. I, I, there's not a single job I can attribute to my sitting there and clicking and submitting. And then, you know, along comes, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Alan Barton, right. Was the first one to be like, do the admin you love. And I was like, oh my God, I have been, <laughs> so we'll talk about like a big, you know, um, actually I'm going to write that in my document now. Uh, talk about a big like lesson and, and turning point. And that was the start of it to sort of, I don't want to say let myself off the hook. You still have to work hard. I'm not saying it's not hard work or that one should be lazy. Um, artists have a hard enough time dispensing with that um, stereotype as it is. But, you know, it's okay to have a life, to pursue other passions, to fill one's life with things that make you happy. Um you know, think about all of the guests that we've had on the show who um, do other things when they're not acting or involved with other things when they're not acting. Um, uh, in some instances, even prefer doing some of these other things besides acting. And then acting just becomes this sort of cherry on top. And these are some of the most successful people who work all the time. That's that's there's something so like beautiful and enriching and interesting about that, you know, type of person. And it has been, uh, you know, a really long journey to get here, but this year, especially, um, being the culmination of 300 episodes of the podcast was a lot of that. Just focusing on other passions, hockey, backcountry, backpacking, um, traveling. Um, and it was, it was, it was amazing. It was, um, <clears throat> you know, I used to, I, I think the other side of this that's important to mention is I use I really did used to beat myself up about, you know, leaving town even like I wouldn't leave town. I wouldn't go anywhere for fear that I might miss an audition or miss an opportunity or not be around. And we just can't we can't, you know, live our lives in in, in fear Um I mean, that's the same fear you're going to take into the room with you when you actually do get an audition, right? You're going to walk in with nerves and like, I, I, I have to book this. I have to book this. I need this job. I need this credit. I need this money. It's, in, it's interesting too, that you say that, uh, we can't live our lives in fear because you, you effectively described two kinds of fear there and they compound on each other and make each, make each one, each one makes the other worse. So you've got number one, fear of missing out. So not missing, not leaving town because you're afraid of missing an opportunity. And then number two, being in the room and then fearing that you're not going to book the job once you do have the opportunity. <laughs> so it's just yeah. this constant like fear cycle that just sort of like piles onto itself and uh getting yeah. past that is probably one of the biggest challenges we have as uh, as actors and creative people. Yeah, and and that's another big learn about just like letting all that go. I mean, I it's all interconnected, right? So, you know, each each of these big learns is going to sort of elide into the next, but it, you know, at the bottom of my document, I I wrote just to remind myself Michael Kostroff's, you're not booking the fucking job. So, you know, let that go. There's so much freedom in that. It's funny because effectively it's, it's sort of lowering your expectations and it, it flies in the face of what a lot of the sort of new agey positive psychology stuff is, which is like, if you expect good things, good things will happen. And yet when it comes to acting, there's freedom in just dropping all your expectations. There is so much freedom in that. Well, it, 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 you can do both. And I can't remember which um, guest said it. Maybe you remember, Trev. But remember someone said, I'm – maybe it was David Yeah, it was, it was Amir Talai. Yeah. Amir Talai. I'm professionally invested but emotionally disconnected. Or unattached, I unattached, think was the yeah, idea. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, professionally invested but emotionally unattached. That's both. That's both that you can, you can still be, cause I get what you're saying about the new age, like, um, being sourced, like I'm going to source that I'm going to book this job. I'm going to book it. I'm going to book it. Well, yeah, of course, like in professionally, yes, of course, like that we, you know, we want to book everything that was right for us and going to move our career forward. Notice I didn't say everything. And yet we don't have to be, you know, emotionally attached to it. In fact, that's 
de- in most cases detrimental yeah. ends up because you're not <laughs> statistically you're not going to book the job it's just so there's so many more no's than there is yeses here that to to hang your heart on every single you know job is it, it could be detrimental to your health um you know let alone your sanity do you believe that this is more a product of just maturing as a human being, becoming more of a of an adult and realizing that, you know, the small stuff is just not worth sweating over? And or is this uh, something that you continually practice and you've got a sort of, you know, mental routine that you that you engage in or the, or checkpoints that you kind of check in with yourself and you go like, OK, AJ, re- remember this, this, this and this. So is it I guess the question is, has it been a natural evolution or has it been a conscious practice or has it been a little bit of both? It, it is a little bit of both. I, I wouldn't say I necessarily have like a, a practice, like I wouldn't say, you know, a direct answer to your question wouldn't be like, yes, meditation is what helped because does meditation help? Yes. But was it the like answer or like the, the, the solve for this? No. So there's, there's lots of little things, lots of little practices, just staying healthy, working out meditation, hanging out with your friends, um, and pursuing other passions which is the one I'm going to come back to for your, your second answer. And then as far as, uh, it being a natural evolution. Yeah. I, I think that there has definitely been a maturity. There's definitely been, um, growth from that time of coming right out of college and thinking like, I've got to be putting in the same amount of time, <clears throat> energy, et cetera, that I was when I was in school. And granted, yes, you can do that, but also uh, there's rent and also you can get really easily burnt out. So that brings me to your second question of, of the, you know, what would be the, the one tip or piece of advice or hack or whatever for, for someone else is find other things that you're passionate about or other aspects of the industry like, you know, creating work, because when you're doing that, even if you sort of cast yourself in something, you're also producing, you're being a project manager, you're being, you're being a filmmaker or, or a theater producer, whatever, you know, piece of art that it is in addition to being an actor. So, so when I say that I can't, you can include art in, in, in what I'm saying, um, you should include art, but find other things that you are passionate about, either just as passionate about or more passionate about than acting and have fun in, in being passion, passionate about that thing. You know, sometimes it's sports for people. Sometimes it's working out. Sometimes it's nature, what, whatever it is for you, you know, as long as it doesn't, as long as it doesn't become, um, it, as long as it doesn't cross that line into obsession or addiction uh, to the point where like, you know, other responsibilities are, are, are falling by the wayside. And I don't mean like acting responsibilities. I mean like, you know, paying your rent and showering. I don't know that that's been my saving grace, mm. hockey, backpacking, you know, all, all these things that are just, re- you know, I think that in general, humans need contact with nature. Um, so if it can include that great, but if not, you know, something that, something that lights you up, something that lights your fire, that's not auditioning. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It really comes down to just having, you know, you talked a few episodes ago about having good sleep hygiene. And I just love that word to apply to things like that word hygiene is just you can apply it to a lot of different things in in life and i think it's it's also applicable to the idea of mental health having good mental health hygiene and that is i think in practice making time and space in your life for diversity really diversity in people and relationships but also in experiences and passions and you know my one of my favorite sort of self-generated mantras that i've kind of been that floats back into my mind from time to time over the years is cultivate curiosity. I think the Mm. more, I think curiosity is a muscle and the more you can practice being curious about things and asking questions about things, the richer your life will become because there, there really is no end to the, the mysteries of life. And, uh, and the more you can lean into those things that sort of, you know, they, they, they kind of grab your heart or your mind or whatever it is and just say like, Hey, there might be something here to explore that, that, 
that, you know, could sort of, I don't know, enrich my life in some way. Um, the more you can do that, I think, the, the better. That is a, a key component of, of good mental health hygiene, as it were. Yeah. You, you know what it reminds me of um, hearing you talk about it that way is when we had Ryan McCartan on the show. One of the things that I loved and respected about the guy, and I, I witnessed it because we shared a uh, you know a dressing room for however you know seven months or whatever it was, um, uh, he would he would always be learning something. You know, you were saying cultivate curiosity, and he 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 like taught himself how to be really good at solving the Rubik's cube. He learned magic tricks uh, with cards and 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 other and other magic tricks. Um, he you know was like a musician like like you are, Trevor. Um, uh, and, and would, you know, um, focus on that from time to time. It was just, there was such a, 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 a student vibe to, to him, right. A student of life kind of thing. Um, and it, yeah, it just reminds me of, you know, when you say cultivate curiosity, that's what I think of, you know, I'm, I'm, I, as we're talking about this, I hope that people are tuned into the fact that every single thing we're talking about translates directly to acting. Cultivating curiosity, being passionate. Um, <clears throat> later on, uh, you know, I may talk about the the, the listening uh, thing that I put in my my document. But it all translates. It all translates to what we do in the art form of acting. That's the big lesson, really. That's the biggest lesson um, I think that we have brought up time and time again, which is just that you know, <laughs> taking care of yourself is 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 essential to your acting. Like there's just no way around it. They are one and the same. You can't do the intimate work of studying the the human condition and be miserable at the same time. I mean, it, it just, it's not sustainable. You might be able to last a few years that way, but at the end, you're just going to burn out, flame out even. It's going to not be pretty. So you've just got to learn how to exist as a complete human being and and give yourself the freedom to be that and not you know buy into the myth that you need to be this hyper focused hyper specific you know work machine it's just not how it works and it it's funny because that lesson i think is so ingrained in our culture you know it, it's mm. pretty much true for every other sort of non artistic pursuit it's like you see people drill down and commit and they make these huge sacrifices in their lives to become lawyers to become doctors to become you know the best at world class at what they do ceos they're constantly saying no to things and i think as an actor and an artist the magic and the filling the well comes from constantly saying yes to, to letting your imagination and your attention sort of, you know, within within reason, but letting it sort of wander and ex- find things and discover things and revel in the magic and the texture of life. Mm. On this note, I also want to ask you, because this is something that I know has been big for you this year. Uh, I want to ask you about... I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Imago therapy? Imago. Imago therapy. It's Imago a, yeah. therapy. You said mm-hmm. this was, was huge for you, and I've shared this with you before on the show, and I think personally as well, but I've noticed a, 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 a big shift in your energy and your relationships and everything in the past you know, several months, and I, um, you, you sort of cite this Imago therapy as, as a huge piece of the puzzle when it comes to uh, your sort of approach to life. So can you talk more about why this has been so huge for you recently? Yeah, so this isn't necessarily, you know, directly from the podcast, but, you know, I sort of interwove lessons from the podcast and lessons from the last um, year, 2017, into my document and thought we, you know, might talk about it on the show. And the thing I said a moment ago about listening is all it, it, and how that's connected to acting. This is this is huge um, as far as that goes. So the, the, the easiest, most simple way that I can describe this therapy practice is you you really focus on other people. (laughs) That's, that's the long and short of it. You're, you're, you are tasked with crossing a figurative bridge to visit the world of the other person. And this goes way deeper than just, you know, 
a day in the life, uh, being in someone's shoes. Um, it's about taking on their perspective, their experiences, their worldview, their, their life, the things that they have gone through in their life, their wounds, their triumphs and, and doing uh, simultaneously removing all ego in order to do this, in order to put yourself into their world. As humans, we are evolutionarily programmed to for self-preservation. We tend to be focused, self-focused, almost exclusively. And the leaders among us, the change makers, the compassionate ones, when you think about <clears throat> people like Gandhi and Mother Teresa, and I know it's cliche, but one of the things that they excel at is compassion. And <clears throat> in a year that has been so divisive, full of so much vitriol and hate and, de as I said, divisive language, this was huge. Because not only did it support me in my primary romantic relationship, but it also just supported me in my friendships, my family, you know, familial relationships. And then, you know, without mincing words, the Trumpsters of the world, the trolls and the, and the, um, and the, and the, and the, the people who support not just the ideas, but the rhetoric, you know, it's one thing if you, if I disagree with your ideas, if you, you know, if you and I have a difference of opinion on, on, you know, how things should be governed in, in our country, it's, it's one thing to disagree on that kind of thing. And another thing for the, the language to get to the level that it has. And it's really nasty and really bad. There's a, a even a war on truth right now that has that we've never seen in this country. We've just never seen it. Um, and I'm really concerned it's going to break us permanently. But for those of us who are, you know, artists and potentially more sensorially sensitive, to talk about self-preservation. How are we going to do that? Well. It's sort of counterintuitive rather than holding up, defending ourselves, shelling up, et cetera. I've been doing my utmost and failing all the time, but doing my best to do the opposite, to reach out, to be compassionate, to try to understand. It's not easy, but that's what this practice has unlocked for me. Um, sorry, I, I rambled a lot. No, no, not at all. Like I said, I've noticed a big shift. I've known you for a long time. Um, you know, not not the longest time in the world, but I think we go back 12 years at this point. So when we when I met you and when we started this podcast, uh, we were completely different people, you and I, than we are today. And so just to hear you um, speak about this is, is really rewarding for me as a friend because I get to sort of get a, a little bit more of an insight into... Um, you know, who you are and what you value and how you've, how you've grown and transformed over the years uh, beyond what I have just sort of experienced and noticed. So it's really, it's really pretty cool, man. And it, especially at this time in history, you know, I think a lot of us are going to see what we're made of. And I think we are seeing what we're made of as a society and especially as individuals and leaders. And I think it's really powerful that, that you just shared that the change makers are habitually putting themselves in other people's shoes and asking, what does the world need and how can I contribute to that? Yeah, because it's not easy and because it's a practice, I, like I, I don't know that I'm doing all of that yet. Um, my word for 2017 was rebirth and I'm, I'm, I was thinking, oh, what should my word be for 2018? And, and, and my, this word popped into my head and it scared the shit out of me. I was like, no, 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 I should pick something else. I should definitely pick something else. And then as soon as I caught myself doing that, I was like, oh, that then that gets to be my word because it just scared it just scared me. Um, and so my word for 2018 is discipline. This is not the discipline as in like flogging myself or something. <laughs> this is 
This is not about, you know, beat up or, um, or, or strictness. It's about, um, practice. It's about, you know, being disciplined in these supportive practices like meditation, like compassion, all the things that you just talked about, acknowledging, you know, what it takes to, to move humanity forward. That that's what it's about for me. How old am I? 33 years on this planet. And I, I, I'm just sort of figuring this part out. So now I'm like, okay, well, how does one put it into practice? I'm not going to go on a hunger strike like Gandhi did. Um, maybe I should. <laughs> you know, it starts transformation societally uh, in the world uh, always starts on a personal level. You know, it, it, it just takes a good friend or a shoulder to lean on or cry on or somebody to listen to you or even just a smile on the street or a kind interaction to transform everything. You know, it's a classic butterfly effect. It's like you've got somebody out there who's just having a really shitty day. Maybe they're thinking some super dark thoughts and it can just be something as simple as stopping and really listening to what they say when you say, how you doing? You know, so we are, we are social creatures. We, need that kind of social attention and interaction and when you have somebody who genuinely does that who 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 genuinely stops and talks to you and makes an effort to be kind and connect with you not just because it's on their checklist to do for the day but they genuinely are interested and again i to use you know to go back to the cultivating curiosity thing i think it absolutely applies to relationships um and other people that can change the world. Yeah, I think it's the most important work you can do. And I think as actors, that's what we've committed ourselves to. And that's really exciting to me. That's why I'm so drawn to this world. This world being? This world of, of, the world. Uh, of artistic expression. Of, yes, you know, and it, storytelling, yeah. It is the most intimate work a human being can do. You know, you asked me earlier about maturity. I don't know that anyone starts out with that being the baseline, being their realization. So many of us got into this because, you know, we were you know, singing into a hairbrush in the mirror as a four-year-old. You know what I mean? Like we don't, we don't put those things together, but yeah, it is, it really is about sort of self knowledge and intimacy and vulnerability and authenticity. It's, it is, it is some of the deepest work that anybody could do. For this episode of Inside Acting is also brought to you in part by VO2GoGo.com, the award-winning voiceover training system and winner of Backstage's Reader's Choice Award for Best VO Training four years in a row. Visit VO2GoGo.com slash start for a free getting started in voiceover online class that will help you add voiceover to your acting portfolio. That's VO, as in voiceover, the number two, GoGo.com slash start. Now I'm curious. Now I want to know. Uh, well, you don't. I, I don't have anything to look at, and you have a, you have an explanation for that. But I, I'm curious about at least one of your, if not more, biggest learns from 300 episodes of of Inside Acting. The reason I haven't put uh, a formal document out there to the world is because this has been quite a year for me. You know, with everything that's been going on in my life. Uh, and I'm, I'm learning the grieving process is, is never over. Uh, you know, I, I would have thought at a certain point I would say like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm over it, you know. Um, but uh, it, it's just ongoing. And it comes, uh, you know, it comes up and the littlest thing will come up and I'll just be thinking of my brother and then boom, you know, I'm back in, the, in, that, in that world of being really at the whim of, of those uh, emotions, that sense of loss. Yeah. And, um, I, I just think this year I'm going to try something a little bit different. Uh, one of the ways I sort of process my anxiety is I just talk, I talk, 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 and I talk a big game and I talk about this and I talk about that and I complain to people and I make big promises and declarations and that's sort of sorry, how I sort of let off steam. And it's not typically backed by a lot of action um, because I feel the release of having talked it through and then I you know tend to go back into avoidance mode and and processing mode, you know, personally. And 
Um, it's not working for me, to be completely honest, uh, on every level. Personally, it's not working for me, you know, artistically, it's not working for me career wise. And so this year, I'm going to keep things a little closer to the chest. I've got some very specific goals I've been coming up with over the past week or two. I've taken some time to really sit down with myself and be real with where I'm at and where I want to be and who I want to be, who I want to practice being. And it doesn't feel right anymore to to publicize it um, the way mm. I have been. So um, I have a lot of intentions. I have a lot of goals. I, I've always been sort of an outcome-oriented person, and yet I've defeated myself uh, in many different ways that I just described. And so I'm going to keep these these goals close to the chest. But I do have a couple of lessons that have been really huge for me that have shown up time and time again, and specifically this year uh with the sort of you know upside <laughs> upside down uh world that i've been um you know uh journeying through and um i would say the the big ones uh are number 1 the cheese will be moved no matter what. Hmm. So how am I going to deal with it? Um, and this obviously showed up my life in a couple of diff- a couple of big ways this year, but you know, my brother passing away unexpectedly, um, it was a big thing of somebody moving my cheese. And it also plays down to the very macro. Like I have a commitment with somebody to meet them at a certain time and they're late or they have to reschedule the last minute. Uh, that's having your cheese moved. So for listeners who might not be familiar with this sort of phrase there's a, there's a book it's a sort of a classic sort of you know personal development business book called who moved my cheese and it's this sort of fable about these the, the way these different mice who are running through a maze handle it when their cheese that they're so used to finding when they take a certain route through the maze and they find their cheese and that's their big reward and they sort of rely on that routine on that path on that predictability and then of course you know some god hand comes down and moves the cheese to a different part of the maze and the different mice you know they they go their usual route and they find their cheese has been moved and the the fable is about how they deal with that cheese being moved some people freak out or some of the mice in the story freak out some of them uh you know go back to planning some of them um you know sit there and deliberate some of them get depressed so in life i'm learning <laughs> at 36 years old that you, the cheese is going to be moved on a daily basis on a daily basis mm. and i have spent so much of my life being upset about that about being annoyed that that my cheese got moved and uh, not handling it productively to be completely honest and so um that's my biggest lesson is that you know what? On a daily basis, the cheese is going to be moved. People are going to be late. People are going to need to reschedule. I'm going to not have the energy I had when I made the original commitment. I'm not going to want to do it. People are going to die. People are going to you know, move away. New people are going to come into my life. And there's always going to be something, right? So how am I going to deal with it? That's the a big learn. What kind of person do I get to practice being such that when my cheese is moved on a daily basis, I handle it in the most sort of, uh, ebb and flow kind of way, you know, what lessons or guests or quotes or things that people have said in during the podcast, do you, do you find yourself pulling from, or, or what do you think you will be pulling from in order to support you in, in, in this? I don't have anything specific off the top of my head as far as, um, a guest that imparted a lesson that would be applicable here or anything like that. But, um, it's more of just like a day to day thing. Uh, I've got my hands on a lot of different projects and I'm, I'm working to sort of consolidate that. So I'm not, my uh, attention isn't spread and my energy diffused, um, across various different sort of things. But, um, I've tended to be a guy who wants to control things, who wants to, you know, create outcomes very specifically. And, and this year has been a lesson in exactly the opposite. But there's a lot of times where you just got to ride the wave. So your idea or um, declaration to to hold things sort of close to the chest this coming year, you, you're saying that that's a direct response to your personal your, or, or your typical modus operandi, which is to sort of shout those results from the rooftop. And that that shouting from the rooftop was actually a, a, a way of ironically a way of hiding. 
Yeah, like preemptively shouting from the rooftop even, just saying like, I am going to do this. And for some people that works. And I think there's a lot of value in sharing your intentions and your goals, uh, not the least of which is creating the sense of accountability. You know, you put yourself on the line when you declare something like that. But it hasn't worked for me. It, it, I find it's a stress release valve more than it is something that energizes and empowers me. Perhaps this phase of my life is quieter and more personal and more... I don't want to say solitary, but uh, certainly more, um, I don't know what the word is, a, a quiet sort of commitment rather than a, a big declaration. So since that was one of the big lessons from this year, I don't think um, myself or our listeners have have gotten a big learn from the 300 episodes of the podcast from you. Yeah. So here, here are my other two uh, big lessons from, from 300 episodes of the podcast. And, and when, you know, when we talk about that, I think we're also talking about the past seven and a half, eight years of, of our lives, because as I said earlier, we're, we're both different people now. I used to be excited to go back and listen to those old episodes. And now I'm actually kind of <laughs> scared. <laughs> like, what, what did I say? What yeah, did I think exactly. was so right that it's just exactly, not. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the second big lesson, and this is directly applicable to the podcast as well as the third one. Uh, the second one is that delegation is freedom. Uh, and another lesson I need to learn time and time again, but that I'm getting better at learning is that there are people out there in the world who enjoy and are much better at the things that I don't enjoy and I'm not, and I'm not good at. And you said it earlier that, uh, all right, maybe it was just in your document, but life is a team sport. It really is. We are social creatures. And uh, again, my controller, you know, uh, aspect of my personality wants to just do everything himself and has this story that I can do it better than anybody else. And yet I create a lot of unhappiness for myself in the process by by attempting to, you know, sort of micromanage everything. And what I've learned through the podcast and working with the amazing people that we have on our team is that, you know what? There are a lot of things that I am not very good at and that I have no interest in doing whatsoever. And those things just so happen to be the specialty and the expertise of other people. And those people love to do that kind of thing. And so it has been such a freeing gift to practice that and be like, okay, cool. You know, <laughs> this is now your realm. And then it's like we go so much farther and faster because of it, because I, you know, disconnected my ego from that whole idea of mm -hmm. I have to do it. Uh, and the third big lesson is uh, and there's a lot of psychology coming out that I think is absolutely fascinating about this. How important play is to adults for adults, not even for adults, just for humans. As children, we understand how important play is. It's an intuitive sort of, it's natural for us. We, we play. That's just what we do. Uh, if we're bored, we just start playing. We, we, our imagination goes crazy and we make up games if we don't have a game at the ready and we, we go explore. And as adults, we, we learn to stop doing that for whatever reason. Maybe it's part of the, the process of getting older or maybe it's just because society sort of beats into us that we've got to be working all the time. But when I make the time to play, and sometimes that means a video game, sometimes that means reading a novel, or maybe that means going out and watching a movie, or it means, I don't know, there's a million different things it could mean. But uh, that's, that's so important for mental health hygiene. <laughs> there it is again. And, and happiness. And I, I've realized over the, the years of doing the podcast that there are two different kinds of play. There's the play that results from work and, and satisfaction. Like, for instance, I don't consider going to swim practice with my swim team. I don't consider that play necessarily, but it recharges me in that when I get out of the water after a really great workout and there's sunshine and water and wind on my skin, I feel so recharged and I feel like I just played even though for an hour I was battling with myself in my head to not quit because it hurts so much. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the other kind of play, which is, you know, playing a video game, for instance, an hour of Starcraft or something. So uh, that second one comes oftentimes with a lot of guilt where it's like, oh, God, I should be working, right? 
So yeah. a, a lesson, sort of mini micro lesson embedded in this lesson of making time to play is something that David shared uh, in this most recent round of uh, videos leading up to the 2018 vo to go launch, where he said, having a bias for action is really uh, the path to freedom. And just that just means, you know, like if you just prioritize things for me, it looks like prioritizing things by emotional payoff. If I look at all the stuff I have to do and I go, which one of these am I going to just feel so glad to have off my plate right now and then tackle that one first and just do it right away. If it comes into my inbox or whatever it is, just handle it. On the other side of that, I've got so much freedom and so much space to indulge in play in a guilt-free way. I think you could almost, it's not quite what I was saying before, but you could almost um, interchange play and passion like, I, you know, when I, I'm passionate about hockey, when I'm on the ice, I do feel that sense of, of play, you know, and, and like I said before, as long as it's not addictive or obsession to the point of, you know, being detrimental to your health or your well being, go for it. It's so important. I'm, I'm actually, as somebody who has known you as long as I have, I'm really excited to hear you <laughs> talk about playing in that way, especially playing, you know, video games for an hour that, uh, would, you know, maybe be seen by some as quote unquote frivolous. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's important. You know, (laughs) I think of my dad who's got this, uh, this Starcraft like game It's called age of empires. And he's got this old PC laptop that he's got it. And that game's like, you know, 15 years old. It's like super old, but it's a real time strategy game. And, um, you know, my dad's a real estate agent, commercial real estate agent. So he works, you know, from home a lot and often on his own schedule so many times throughout my childhood and growing up, uh, you know, in high school and then coming back from college. And even now going back to Philadelphia to see my family for the holidays, I know there will be times in the middle of the afternoon where I hear those sounds of my dad's, you know, team raiding a, a village or something on this game. And my dad's, you know, 67 years old. And, uh, and I, I've just learned that he understands the importance of taking breaks to reward yourself with some play. And for him, a big part of that play is this game, which again is so old. It's like ancient by technology standards. And yet it does the trick. It does the job and he really enjoys it. And so, um, that's important. And I've, I have heretofore, uh, (laughs) given myself a really hard time when it comes to, uh, permission to do those kind of things. Mm. And, um, I think it's because I always felt like there was something undone that was pressing that had a deadline looming that I needed to be putting my attention on. But the truth is there's always going to be that. Yeah, I was going to say that's always. life. That's life. That We're is all, life. Yeah. So I, I've just started the practice of organizing my list of, in terms of emotional payoff, like, all right, wh- which one of these is causing me 80% of the anxiety that I'm feeling right now? If I handle that, my reward is guilt-free movie time or guilt-free cooking time. Cause cooking is play for me. Um, guilt-free, you know, video game time. And it, it, it works. It works really well for me. It works really well. Dude, that is huge. I, I, it's so funny how like you'll just say something sort of offhanded and I'm, I'm like, excuse me, what? Like we, can we drill down on that? <laughs> because it, you just sort of offhandedly threw out there. Yeah. So my lists are now organized by, I don't know how you said like emotional, what did you call it? Like a, emotional, uh, what payoff? did I say? Emotional priority or something like emotional that. Emotional priority. Yeah. Holy crap, dude. Can you, you need to write that book. You you need to you need to patent that. <laughs> right, you need to copyright that right now. Better do it before this episode uh, goes live. That's huge. That's huge. Like to to organize, and it's almost like you could make like two lists. You could make like a list of like uh, big big emotional you know payoffs. Like this is gonna be awesome and fun, and then big emotional like ang- like this is making me anxious, <clears throat> and and arrange it. You know, so that the things that are making you the most anxious go towards the top and the things that are going to be the most fun go towards the top. And you're like, as soon as I get this one done on this list, then I can have this one at the top of this list. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That, that's a system. Uh, you know, I use that word in quotes, a system that works really well, I think, for me and for a lot of people, especially if, if you're listening to this and you're like, I'm also a super emotional, sensitive person, Trevor. Uh, try this. Try organizing your things in terms of emotional payoff or, or emotional uh, freedom or whatever it is. And and maybe it'll it'll work. And I think also putting, you know, a reward at the top of your list, your guilty pleasure. You know, if there is such a thing as a guilty pleasure, maybe you should just enjoy it guilt free. Uh, prioritize those too, you know, and, and see what happens. 
I think that's also something that feeds directly back into the the journey of a, of a creative person, especially an actor. You know, like we can only be present and do our the best work we can do when we're we're not tied down by the anxiety of of our to do list, and yeah. and and if we feel like we haven't had the opportunity to play and recharge that battery. Like, how, do you, how are you going to show up to an audition or a set or a rehearsal or a performance and do your best work if in the back of your mind you're going, oh, God, I could get that thing done and I feel so burnt out and I just want to go drink a glass of wine and play StarCraft. <laughs> you know, like, doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh, that's why Emily Rose lines up a um, trip to Disneyland after auditions. Yeah. So yeah, it's, a, it's not anxiety, you know, on the other side of this audition. It's fun and play. and Yeah. 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 Well, anyway. uh, I hate to kind of bring this to a, a somewhat abrupt end, but we we do have to boogie. We're out of time. Um, any last final thoughts for this episode uh, before we close it out? I'll just say, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the inner game on this episode, which I think is super important and probably more important than any of the to do lists or the or the, or the, you know, material, like making sure you have your, you know, headshots and real and resume, all that stuff. Like it's a really important, it is, but you know, after 300 episodes of this thing, I, I, I think I can pretty confidently say that like the inner stuff is more important. All that other stuff will come, but, uh, you know, get your house in order. One of my big takeaways from the pod podcast being specificity, you know, with, guests like Jenna Fisher and Chelsea Crisp and you know that that's huge huge it it worked out you know so big for them and I think that's really important but it almost comes full circle back to the inner game because you can't be specific until you know thyself you know so anyway um I think that's my big my big uh summary of uh, of our episode today how about you Amen. And I would just add that, and I had this thought while I was swimming the other day because I didn't want to get in the pool. I was at, I was on deck and the coach was like, get in, you have 10 minutes to warm up. And I was like, I don't want to be here. I just want to go home and sleep or whatever. And, and uh, I was really feeling the resistance, but I got in and like three strokes into that, that length, that length of the pool. I was like, God, I love this. This is so great. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. And then I just uh, caught myself and I was like, wow, are you serious, Trevor? Like you, you really went from like cold to hot that fast? And I caught myself and the, and the thought that popped into my head was that commitment is the only thing that can be trusted. And I was like, I just realized that moment that I was like, wow, oh I, I can't trust my emotions. I can't trust my my um." My preferences in the moment. The only thing I can trust is what am I committed to? And again, this is a fundamental life lesson that is obvious for a lot of people. And then there's people like me who need to learn it over and over again. But sometimes it's that it's that moment of recognition that just lands. And I've known this for a long time intellectually, but I didn't get it on a heart level until I got in for that swim practice. And I saw myself switch a full 180. And then I realized commitment is the only thing that can be trusted. And with this podcast... There's no way we would have gotten to 300 episodes if you and I and the entire team weren't committed. I haven't always wanted to to, to do the work to, to put a podcast episode out. And there are other times where I've been really excited to do it. But commitment is what got us here, you know, from everybody. Um, so that would be my final sort of lesson and takeaway. What are you committed to? And it's as simple as that. On or, on or off. Wow, dude. You really just baked my noodle. <laughs> Had to slip it in there, man. 300 episodes. I get it. There it is. All right. Well, guys, thank you for listening to the 301st episode of Inside Acting. We hope this was valuable for you. We have a lot of great stuff planned uh, for the next sort of season of the podcast. We've got a few picks of the week banked. We've got some listener questions banked. We've got some interviews banked, many interviews in the works. Uh, we're really excited for what's next. However... We are going to take uh, about a month or so to reflect on uh, what got us here and what's next for the podcast. So we're not going to be releasing an episode for a good four to six weeks while we take some time to connect with ourselves, both individually and as a team, and see if we can reimagine what the next 300 episodes of the podcast might look like. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we're completely different people 
now than we were when we started the podcast. And the podcast is has been wonderful, but we all sense the need for uh, at least some evaluation as to uh, exploring other options, formats, um, focuses with, with the podcast as it is now. So we'll be back in your feed with new content, uh, probably beginning of February or so, maybe sooner. But stay tuned to our social media, stay tuned to our newsletter, stay tuned to your podcast feed, and um, we'll have the latest for you soon. We hope you guys have a wonderful 2018. You know what I realized, Travis, we've never um, chosen to take uh, a break like this. Uh, the last time we took an extended break was because we had a failed foray into making this a video podcast and then realized it wouldn't work and then everything came, you know, came crashing down with our feed and everything. So, you know, um, we're, 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 this is a conscious choice and it's all to make it a better, a better podcast and better experience for you, our listeners and I was thinking too, Trev, we didn't talk about this, but um, I would love to hear from people if they have things that they are interested in, um, whether it's process formatting or content, if you have things that you just want to send our way, things you've been thinking about with regards to the podcast, especially if you are a longtime listener and <clears throat> you're invested in this as much as we are, your input is, is, is extremely valuable. Uh, from that vantage point. So uh, email us, tweet us, Facebook us, whatever is easiest for you. Call us, leave us a voicemail. But uh, I would love to hear from people um, if they have uh, things that they've been thinking about around, uh, like I said, process, format, or content. All right, let's boogie. Let's boogie out of here. Today's episode of Inside Acting was produced and hosted by A.J. Meyer and, of course, Trevor Algat. Team IAP also includes Jen Levin, Grace Gordon, Gadali Gubrek, and Deborah Smith. And of course, looking back on 300 episodes, Nelson Murray, Jasmine Bristow, and Timothy Patrick Waterman, as well as Fern Lim designing our logo. You guys can visit us online at insideacting.net to uh, learn more about the show, listen to all our episodes, sign up for our weekly email dispatch. Uh, we're also on social media, and you can pretty much find Inside Acting wherever you look for your podcasts. You can directly support the continued production of Inside Acting with either a one-time financial contribution or an ongoing monthly contribution. Just visit insideacting.net to learn more and uh, help us keep the lights on and the episodes coming. And that does it for episode 301 of Inside Acting. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for helping us get here and for listening. We hope you enjoy uh, everything you hear. And uh, until next time, trust your commitment. Trust your commitment.